It's May the 27th, 2023, and you are listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hey, how's it going? I'm Chris. That's Jeremiah. <laughs> Hi. Hello, hello. Good Caught morning. Me with my coffee. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I caught you in the act. Um, yeah, uh, we are the two of us. So Jeremiah, it's a fa- uh, uh, <laughs> Adrian has a family <laughs> thing going on. So, um, but we will bring you a little news roundup today. There's lots to talk about. Things have happened, yes. and yes, things are careening wildly into the future. <laughs> yes, they are. So, uh, future, future, future. Of course, will include some talk of AI, but not only AI, we'll also go into legal issues and things. So this is exciting. So uh, let's kick it off with the big thing that we have um, probably all seen by now, um, which is Photoshop Generative Fill. Adobe is going AI, it's going full in on AI. We've seen them do that a while with their like sensei network thing and uh and 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 the, and the different products have gotten different features i mean lightroom for example subject selection and ai masking and these kind of things have been in there for a while now but um they adobe has has ventured into generative stuff as in using prompts and other things to generate imagery and we are seeing that in uh, in their Firefly product, for example, which is a f- which, which tries to compete with Midjourney, Mid-Journey and, and others, Stable Diffusion, yes, not not, not, not that not that successful <coughs> at this point, but no. As as an early adopter of uh, Firefly, I was in very early when they started to release it in beta, and um, th- there are some structural. Um, promises that I think could be very interesting uh, were they to kind of get a little bit more refined, debugged, and and um, the results better. And, and that's basically, you could put in a prompt and select a model. I think that's a very, very nice adjunct where you can select a model to lean in a direction um, that will give you at least a step up to right. generating the right image. Uh- I think I think the, the 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 good and the bad thing with Adobe well they have an advantage they claim that their generations are entirely safe for use in a business context so we're looking at um, their, their training data not being let's say slightly dodgy with with uh, strange sure. sources but uh, they they have pretty much Adobe stock as the source and if you're an, an Adobe stock member I think you've probably signed away. That right, that so, so they can train on your imagery. I'm not, not sure exactly how this works, but anyway, it's business safe. That's one thing. <clears throat> but that in turn also means that their training data isn't necessarily it's not deep as as, as not, deep as others have. It's not so. deep. It's not wide, and it's it's very limited. But yeah. um, it, it, structurally, the, it it's good. It integrates fine. I've, yeah. you know, I. Uh, you know, we'll talk about Photoshop in a moment, but because um, I've been using um, G- generative fill all week to just explore mm. it, and, and it's very interesting. Um, it, it has the promise of something like Dragon, um, very, very um, interesting in terms of image. What we call it transformation, not even editing, because editing is... That, that's the thing, it's editing. When we look at editing, most of Photoshop's editing... At least to a certain point, used to be very dark room adjacent. Very okay. Here's your yes. dodge. Here's your burn. You change the contrast. You uh, maybe cut something out and put it on a separate layer and and change how it blends with the rest. This is a very very analog style. But now you have you have the uh, the generative fill, which pretty much allows you to select part of the image and say, okay, um, fill it. And and that could be that could be changing the background of something. That could be just adding things in there. As in, oh. here, make a square and 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 put yeah. a put a dog in there or something. And I've I've seen some very hilarious hilarious um, examples where somebody did a a selfie and then went, oh, you know, my eyes are closed. I think I'm going to open them and then created, you know. Circle the eyes, added eyes, generated big manga eyes, and then a huge mouth with teeth, and then oh, oh, and, and, 
and and you do have you you do have a choice. I mean, you can you can let Photoshop figure it out, uh, or you can give it a prompt and say, "I want this to be filled in to that space." And exactly. I mean, you know, all of this stuff um, has a just a very very curious. Um, goal in terms of the redefinition of what editing is, and we can talk about that. Um, one of the things that I use in Photoshop is I, you know, I do have <clears throat> the ability to use stable diffusion within Photoshop that if I prompt, I'll get a separate layer that I can blend the layers that I so created and then... You, you brought Stable Diffusion into Photoshop using a plugin, right? So A plugin, it, yes. It, it's a very similar process, pretty much, isn't it? It, it, it is, but it uses a, a deeper model. It uses a more yeah. interesting model. And, and what's interesting is uh, I haven't tried to use both of them together, but I assume that if I take a kind of a root photo, um, I regenerate that in a descriptive style, I blend those, and then I, I start to take the generative fill and go into a more micro level. Uh, I, I hesitate to even call it photo editing anymore uh, because, you know, I always realize that, or I've always come to use photo editing as you take your root photograph taken by a camera, generally, it's my definition, um, and you adjust it Tonally, with luminance, you you adjust the contrast of the color, but the, you're the always the darkroom thing, right? That's it. And, but the, the root foundation of the image is that which, which is what you have captured. Yeah. And um, you know, it's funny <laughs> me talking about this because <laughs> I'm like you. You have been doing generative stuff for for, for a long ages, time. Right? So so. But but I the tool is so good and and I think that Adobe's I, I'm not even going to say a step into this because this is a big jump especially generative fill it's it's created huge waves within the photo editing business you know everyone's talking about it this week because it is a significant and amazing tool used uh, both in extremists and use subtly, um, both for transformative um, uh, processes. And, and we should start to see um, questions whether a edited photograph um, that is in some ways more than I don't know, five, 10 percent different from the raw images is uh, are, are there going to be committees that judge what a photographic editing process is or not and and you know just as an aside I mean, where's the where is the line i personally don't care because i always think it's the image silly react to the image how does it make you feel how you get there is your own journey, and and that's okay. I mean, those those lines have always been blurry, especially since digital, since Photoshop came along, um, and other tools. Um, and I'm I'm with you on the on the. I don't really care. I th I think a lot of the oh my god, the world is coming to an end is is, is a gatekeeping move that I don't think we need. No. So um, I'm all for new tools and new ways to tell stories um, and and this is not a new thing for Adobe do you remember when they introduced their sensei sure. product online in the cloud and that I mean it's still happening in the cloud right There's, they have huge infrastructure sure. for that now but um, that that had the first inklings in their context aware fill which uh, they, they showed examples years ago they showed examples where they had a mountain and then they they marked um, the, the the lower part of it and said uh, here this is now in front of a lake and it reflects off the lake and it did it not as good as these days but it was it was an early early ish trying that so Adobe has a lot of experience in that I think the the real the real big thing is going to be the 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 their focus on businesses I'm pretty sure that a lot of businesses will go to Adobe even though the quality might not be as good because they can rely on that thing being legally safe uh, for, for, for copyright infringement and these kind of things. 
Well, but by the way, they've been doing it with their neural filters for at least a, a year or more. Yeah. Um, you know, where, where you can actually, you know, change, you can identify the eyes, the eyeballs, and say, shift yeah. them a little bit to the right. And they'll yeah. shift to the right, almost unnoticeable. Um, almost. Uh, and, and you know... You know, you know. If you look at if you look at TikTok and others that have live uh, neural filters now, you can you can change someone's age by twenty five years without oh, yeah. anyone noticing and li- doing it live in real time. Um, but we'll we'll get to more of this neural editing uh, towards the end of this episode. Um, let's make a jump to sure. the legal thing because that is something that I, I would like to hear your opinion on this I'm, I'm a, I live in Germany, you live in the United States and different um, laws we, we have we have yeah. different laws regarding copyright, regarding uh, um, the, the, the rights to the image, to your creation right, if you, if you take a picture of something in Germany we have what's called Urheberrecht which is the originator's right the, if, if I take a photo, I have that right by <coughs> default. It's my right, and it's pretty much impossible to give someone else that right because no one else is the originator of that work than I am. But um, you can give the peop- someone else a usage right. You can say, okay, you have the right to use this in a publication, in this distribution, this ge- geography, in this time frame, and so on. Very classic um, print media centric and of course the internet has been shoehorned into that later you can use that online you can use it offline and so on um and one thing that doesn't really translate between the and i think the u.s is similar in that uh, respect but one thing that does not really translate is fair use yes so in the united states (coughs) you you have fair use which allows others to use parts of a work in their own work under certain circumstances. And there is some yeah, fine, fine nuances, but we don't really have that here. So Yeah, I, I, you know, having you know, been a, a, a fan of the support of artists um, and provenance in Europe, and of course here less so, um, I was always very enamored with um, Ethereum, smart contracts, the ability to basically assign within a smart contract on the blockchain, right. who can do what with your images? And <laughs> if it is sold, uh, how does that revert back to you in terms of, of sales, etc.? But enforcement is something quite different. And of course, you have to be dealing with Ethereum, you know, when you're managing trading uh, using uh, an image. So the widespread adoption is not there yet. Of course, Adobe has also been... Uh, uh, experimenting with uh, embedding um, uh, ownership into the actual uh, images as well and, and to create some kind of registry. And I have friends who are involved in that as well in mm-hmm. separate and more independent ways. The uh, fair use here, which is something I'm reasonably familiar with because a lot of my work uh, earlier certainly has been in terms of, of um, ad- um, adoption or uh, so. So today we would call this a mashup, right? You would use something that someone else took in in music. It would be sampling. Uh, in yes, exactly. art. It would be like like good example, <coughs> current example. Andy Warhol. He. That's a very good uh, example. He, yes. He used a lot of photography to base his works of art on it, and so far, uh, it was always uh, it, it was always claimed that that is fair use. The, so that the, has changed yeah. now, right? Well, f- fair use with uh, Warhol being a good example. Um, Warhol's paintings of the Campbell soup cans really is fair use because uh, you're talking about creating a work of art that in no way, shape, or form reduces people's will, need to buy Campbell's Soup. <laughs> so he is not directly competing with Campbell's... Co- commercially. <clears throat> That's right. So Commercially, right. And it is commenting on the graphics and the ideology and the contemporary cultural iconography of that particular well-known brand. So that's 
that's why this has never really come to court in terms of that. With the Prince, it's a little bit different because the which is the current case. Let's let's just that's right. Brief briefly a look at that. So so Prince uh, Warhol has uh, has used a photo of Prince taken by Lynn Goldsmith, Goldsmith. and uh, there is a current ruling now um, because because Lynn Goldsmith claims that that is not fair <coughs> use, um, and the uh, Supreme Court, the highest court in the United States, has now ruled that. Yes, this is not a case of fair use. Now, this is what's interesting about this case is it's not as much about how the image itself was used to recreate, say, a one-off painting, which is sold, or even an edition. This particular case revolved around the licensing from the Warhol family Uh -huh. in terms of that particular image. So, they owned, I'm talking about the Warhol estate claim to own the Warhol interpretation of Lynn Goldsmith's image. Mm -hmm. And that isn't what was in dispute, not even by Lynn Goldsmith, who I believe, uh, and I could be wrong, welcome to correction, that there was an agreement in terms of the use of that one time for some magazine cover or something. The difference is she did not give them the right to resell that and license that image ah. in an ongoing way. And the court found that they have to pay her a percentage of the license fee. So this comes down not as much as an aesthetic decision as much as a commercial decision so so it, this doesn't say fair use is out the window no it says in this case because and because as you said with the campbell soup um people will still buy the soup but in this case it's an image versus an image and there's a commercial interest and that uh, and goldsmith's photo is let's say somewhat equivalent to to warhol's yeah. uh, work of art Well, uh, it, it draws from, I mean, Lynn Goldsmith took the root picture. Yes. Uh, it was redone by Warhol, which in and of itself, one could argue this in court too, whether that's fair use or not. That's another discussion. We could follow this one with that, because um, I have some experience in that as well, um, is really about the licensing. In other words, if you start to use... A, or reuse an image that I created to your benefit without mine in some ways that I did not give you the license to do that. I didn't deny you, but I didn't give it to you. Uh, the, uh, you could see why that went through the court. And, and in some ways, um, I think the, it, it was very controversial within the court itself. Uh, fair use is a very, very um, complicated um, subject, for example, you know, a lot of my work has been appropriated early work through, from video games. And I've spoken to the heads of these video game companies, and, and they basically, from the creative point of view, see, uh, they're, they're like, no, obviously your work of art printed, exp you know, um, shown in a gallery doesn't in any way take away from the sales of our video games. Um, if I then created a video game based on my work, that would be in direct competition and that would not be fair use. The difference is the legal departments of these companies can basically go, you know what, we're going to sue you anyway, even though, according to the letter of the law and the judge and jury, uh, would by law probably, probably underscore that, find you innocent of appropriating Uh, art and and uh, and support your fair use of someone else's initial uh, creation because you are commenting on it socially you are recontextualizing it and that's fair use but does an artist want to spend a quarter of a million dollars in two years <laughs> can <he>? in in <laughs> court fighting this which would prob probably again uh, he would or she would probably win. Um, the difference is that when you put anything in front of a jury, 
any lawyer will tell you anything can happen. Yeah. In, in other words, there is no fixed law, especially when it comes to uh, people's points of view, what they think is right, what the feeling is. So when it comes to works of art, um, you know, that is a extremely delicate um, kind of position and it usually is going to be fought with uh, major players. And, and I think that because the, the artists who do that, while it's okay in a, in a small gallery, nobody's going to come at you. But if you do a book where, and the book is for profit in, with 10,000 copies, even though it's socially commenting on an original piece of, of uh, work, uh, it, it means that you could be found guilty of exploiting that for your personal gain and not, you know, not at least um, creating a condition of license to the original, which is um, one of the things that I had proposed in this case to take, take one, that any sale of any book, I haven't done it, but, but if I were to make a book, that used your imagery, that I would feel I should effectively pay you a license for it. Mm -hmm. So um, these are, you know, fungible things. These are, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and again, different depending on your jurisdiction. And the, the, I've, I'm, I'm still waiting for someone to take the initiative to kind of unify copyright law worldwide to make this whole yes, thing I, <coughs> more transparent to people and more Yes, like, it's not transparent, it's very opaque. And yeah. the problem with copyright law and patent law is it's seriously out of date. Yeah. It, can, oh, yes. it can't really keep up it, with it where we're from going. It comes from an area of, 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 of fax machines. I mean, Even there Gutenberg. Go. <laughs> yes, it's Gutenberg. just like... All right. So Before we get to the picks of the week, um, let's talk about Dragon. Just uh, as a as a as a little move back into AI. So here's the thing: there's there's ways to generate, and there's ways to take something and generate something based off of that, or modify it with current means that would be diffusion networks we're talking again DALI and stable diffusion and mid journey and then there's GANs a generative adversarial network which is the older technology and um, a few years ago was was very big in the news because it could generate for example fake people uh, faces of fake people and fake other things um, and the GANs aren't dead they are alive and kicking especially uh, because they are fast. And here is a new GAN that has been um, presented, which is is in the editing realm. So just imagine, just imagine you take, let's say you have a dog in a photo and that dog is looking to the side and you want to look it at, want to have it look at the camera. That would be quite a task to do this in Photoshop, right? You'd have to do illustration work and find... <laughs> I, I don't know. It's a, it's a huge, big thing. In Dragon, you would just attach like a drag handle to that picture and drag it around. And I, th when I heard about this, I was like, "Yeah, this is not. This is not going to work. This is not going to work." And then I saw this demo video online um, where they show that. And this is real time, by the way. This is not something that has been rendered for hours. No, they are taking those dogs and make them look somewhere else. They are taking a car and change the, the, the properties, the shapes of the lights, the direction it points. They take uh, like a skirt and make it longer by just attaching a drag handle and pulling down. And this is this is completely wild. Um, how's that? I mean, how's that possible? I don't know. You will probably also not be able to explain how it does it, but that has implications in terms of image editing. In a big time, in a big way, right? Well, I think I think that uh, what it what it appears is is several fold. One, it, it uses uh, a kind of um, AI to of determine course. to determine what it is, and then it 
goes into a library and recreates that based on what it, quote, sees or, uh, you know, comprehends. Um, of course, when you reduce this to code, I, I'm just wondering <laughs> how complicated the code is here to do something as simple as that. Well, um, it's it's a it's again, and some of these uh, neural networks work in in the the network itself. The neural network will do the the bulk of the work, and the code is relatively simple. Again, I haven't looked under the hood. I'm not a developer, but just just the the the, the sheer thought of being able to edit something in such a simple way, just by dragging something and it changes and it intuits what you want to do, at least to a certain point, or you add some additional handles to make sure, I don't know, you move the head without moving the direction of the eyes, for example, um, or make someone's nose smaller or change the size of their head their hat or I don't know I mean Vogue, Vogue has up. been doing this for a long time for their covers uh, yes. but doing it in a much more complicated way that's right? the thing this is this is this democratizes retouching uh, retouching <laughs> pretty much in a big way this yeah. makes it, this makes retouching accessible to every single person and this is again I, 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 I bet when this comes out in products it will be on your smartphone you oh will, sure. You will tap and drag around on that image, and it'll do the things you hopefully do the things you you expect, and then you send it to your friends and have a laugh. Uh, yes, and I I see the you know the next version of generative fill is integrating their neural filters, a dragon, yes. and yes. so you know you, you basically you know you circle a face, and it's not just changing the dynamic of the eye size or whatnot, but the, the complete expression, which you can do in a minor way, but this is a major way. And then you can add with, when you add um, layers to that and blending to that, um, I think we're headed, if we kind of bring it into the future of photography vernacular, um, the question of what constitutes a pure photograph is always going to be upon us in terms of how you manage that. And, and you know, I, I, I've just been asked to, um, there's a new photographic museum going to be opening here in Long Beach in the fall. And, and I've been asked to be part of a, a small, you know, a two-man show. And I'm, you know, I was very... You know, I was kind of taken aback. Should I, should I exhibit <laughs> my photographic like AI work, or do I have to be a purist about this? I, I seriously don't know anymore about what makes a photograph be a photograph. Like, how pure do you have to be? Is it I just mean, if, showing if, raw images? I don't know. If we go back to the to the word photograph, writing with light or painting with light, that's pretty much yeah. everything. I mean, <laughs> sort of, isn't it? And and uh, of course, I mean, some some publications, for example, have have formalized that. If you look at National Geographic, uh, they had, I think, in the eighties or nineties, they had this scandal about the yeah. pyramids of Gizeh, where they 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 in the early days of digital photo retouching, they, they, they moved two pyramids closer together so they fit on the front page and didn't declare that and uh, got, made a big kerfuffle. But, um, and after that, they declared, no, raw files, pretty much. And photographers still have to deliver raw files to National Geographic now. Um, of course, that doesn't, does, that doesn't prevent them from doing like in-camera double exposures and these kind of things because the cameras save those out <laughs> as raw files. But, but it, it, it reduces the <clears throat> amount of um, shenanigans you can do with your photos. The, the thing is, I always ask, to what end at the end of the day? Especially yes. for art. I understand for news, uh, having an identifier or, or some moniker that says these photographs have not been manipulated in any way, I think could be valuable, though I think we'll be overwhelmed by the amount of <laughs> manipulated images anyway. And I think people are now questioning when they kind of scroll through 
um, social media, they don't even react to what's real and what's not. I mean, it's I, I, I include myself among that. Uh, you know what I mean? I, often I see a beautiful photograph, pure photograph, and I go, oh, wow, is, is that real? Was that sky really that color? Was it? We um, are going to <clears throat> probably have to live with, uh, with the fact that people won't trust photography anymore. Which, yes. which, which, in, I mean, if you look Why at Photoshop. Why should they in the first place? <laughs> if you look at Photoshop and if, if you look at what has been already done to a lot of uh, photographs, mm. I wonder, I wonder, and, and people, a lot of people have not developed that doubt about photos still, even mm. though we all know that that person doesn't have a skin that good or is not that slim or doesn't have any blemishes and then you look at behind the scenes and oh of course they do have pimples and of course stuff has been retouched um but still in the in the mind of a lot of people that doesn't happen uh, and I, f i i wonder if this is the moment when the general public will begin to doubt and then of course what will that do yeah what will that do is the interesting yeah. question is how how does that uh how does the one more institution uh, which is no longer trusted <laughs> manifest in a culture yeah. where people don't trust institutions in so many ways and that creates uh, social problems. Uh, there's no common ground of truth. Um, and when we reach that, uh, history has proven that uh, conflict generally ensues. Um, but We're in. We're we're basically in in new territory yes. where we cannot believe our own eyes anymore. And um, while that may be good for artists, it may be bad for politicians. Um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, on to the picks because they they are they are the, at least my pick is is sort of in that direction still. Um, have you heard of blip diffusion? So it's another it's another diffusion network. Uh, if you want to, let's say you have a product that you want to sell and you want to take or generate pictures of that product in different contexts. I don't know my backpack in the Sahara and on the back of a, a, a person X and in 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 a in in a in a, in a hall of mirrors or whatever. Then uh, you 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 can train a network based on I don't know 10, 15, 20 pictures of that backpack and then generate pictures of that. Um, Blip Diffusion now uh, puts this to a different level because they have uh, the ability to do this with one single picture and it looks good. So we have a few, a few examples here uh, on, the, on the video and we'll of course link to that paper here or to that website. Uh, in one input image and then you just give it a prompt and it makes, here's a dog and they have a, the, the dog in a Batman suit and pa as painted by Van Gogh or in a bucket or eating ramen. Um, that's the first thing that Blip Diffusion can do. The second is um, it can change things. So in this case, it's a backpack and now they have, they they show it with a golden surface or cube shaped or at the grand canyon so it 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 allows that um and there are some examples here that look very good very very good there's an example of this teapot in in different contexts or the dog in different contexts um and now we come to the image manipulation subject interpolation just imagine a dog and a cat at two different ends of that spectrum and now you can interpolate between these just by sliding a slider that's wild there, yeah there like i was uh, just arrived in my inbox some some diffusion yeah. um model which basically was focused completely in the in the uh, kind of context of advertising yeah. and it was just backgrounds in other words yeah. take a you know just whatever you have You want to put it in a desert, you want to put it in a studio, you want a model background, you want it against a window. And these were like apparently really high, high end backgrounds, mm -hmm. perfectly useful for commercial photography. So commercial photographers, beware. This is all coming uh, at you. Here's subject driven style transfer. We have on the one axis, we have things on the other axis, we have other things. So here's a sphinx and uh, on the other axis, there's fire or... Uh, 
cherry blossoms or glass and you just have a sphinx made, made of glass or in the colors of cherry blossoms or a, a teapot uh, made of glass. It, it, it is so wild what is possible. Um, and again, this is just a matter of time for this to end up in products. So we'll My pick was basically, you, you put it up there, it's Photoshop. It's Photoshop. <laughs> That's, it's Photoshop. Yeah. It's my pick of the week. Uh, I, I think that the amount of work that the researchers who are working under the hood at Adobe, this is only the stuff that they've released to us now. The stuff that is yes. ongoing is obviously going to be much more in-depth and much more, uh, I don't know, in the control of the user. And, and um, and you know what? One contender in that field is Serif with their Affinity products, Affinity mm -hmm. Photo, Affinity Designer, and so on, which I love to use. They're yeah, they fast, they're nimble, they work on different platforms. Um, but I wonder how they will respond to the whole AI thing because at, to this point, and they just released their version 2.1 of their product line, I wonder, I haven't, haven't seen AI in there. So that's the big question that I have at this point. Are, are they working on that? Is there something coming? Are they, uh, yeah, yes. or are they going to fall behind in that race? Because I think this will be a very big, a very big uh, factor. In sure, the Topaz, another company that um, that has been working very specifically yes. with, with narrow models of, of sharpness and, and um, depixelation and that kind of. Uh, approach and, and obviously um, blow-ups that, that appear to be very sharp. Uh, Remini, another another very interesting yep. um, uh, project which, which I use really effectively. Not for all images work, but when it works, it works dazzlingly well. Um, I think that uh, whoever really gets the deepest into AI, whether they use it in an sort of a subtler way uh, or whether they kind of broadcast it, I think that that is going to be the competitive nature of these photo editing uh, arenas. And we know that Adobe has very deep pockets and uh, will probably, if they are going to pay a license to model and train, they can afford to do it. And and, and I'm sure they would be, quote, happy to do it. Um, so, Yeah. All right. The so. By the way, the question is, if your images are used in a training model, how do you get paid? How that you is know? the big, that is in getting in front of the course right now. We are going to see uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, legal stuff coming up here from different sides. So a lot of Sturm und Drang. <laughs> Sturm und Drang, yeah. And, and of course, um, this means that sooner or later we might have to rename this podcast the future of <laughs> photography or is it the future of art of it, um, art visual art that doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well as photography I know. like calling it photography for all its we should open this discussion. Definitions. Everyone, yeah. let us know. Let us know on our socials at The Future of Photography or our website, thefuturephotography.com. We are going to be back with, yeah, photography or other things. Let's call everything photography from now on. <laughs> How about that? Uh, all right, okay. everyone, take care. See you in a week from now. Um, have a good one. Enjoy the week. And bye-bye. Bye-bye. been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. <laughs>